<clears throat> the issue that I'm going to address uh, today is to um, extend the maturation or hang time, as uh, people call it. And I'm going to try to solve the, pos the puzzle. I don't promise anything. But uh, uh, a little bit of the agenda, the topics that I'm going to talk about. Can anybody hear me? Yeah? OK. So extend the maturation, where are we now? Um, if, if you guys remember, in 04, we were all complaining about extending maturation and talking about hang time. Uh, now, the last two years, well, I guess I should say the last three years, 05, 06, and 07, it wasn't that bad, um, especially in 07. Um, people kind of forgot about it, but I think it's still uh, um, an issue that we should address. Um, identifying the key factors, the factors that we should uh, look at um, when we when we talk about hang time and when we talk about managing our vineyards and our grapes to avoid some of the problems that we can get into. Correlations between berry sensory and fruit chemistry, that's something that we and Gallo have worked uh, quite extensively in the last four years, uh, trying to correlate berry sensory with berry and wine chemistry, and I'll show some data. Sugar loading and flavor development. Um, I hope that I'm able to um, make everybody, you know, um, understand that sugar loading uh, is not related at all with flavor development. But I'll, I'll show some data and, and we can talk about it. And then the, um, the biggest issue that we had in 04, as I say, which was yield losses due to extended maturation or hang time. And lastly, if I had time, uh, irrigation management, management, and that was part of my thesis, um, as, as Deborah said, for, um, I was my master's, not my PhD, but uh, thank you, Deborah. I'm working on my PhD, by the way, but not, not yet. Um, so as a, to start somewhere, extend the maturation, and what do we understand by extend the maturation? And then there's a definition there. Of course, definitions are never completely true, but one of, one of them is, is the practice of delaying grape harvest beyond standard maturity levels, St understanding by that bricks, 24, 23 bricks, um, in order to enhance berry flavor development and promote um, degradation of undesirable green characteristics or green aromas. How do we get into this? Um, the graph shows the average bricks at harvest for all California. So it's, it's a very, very rough number. But if you do it for pretty much every, every county inside California, you'll find the same trend. So what I want to show here is the trend how from 1990 to this, this last point is last year, we gained around three bricks in average. And that's average for all red cultivars, again, for all the state. Uh, of course, if you do it in Napa or Sonoma, the value instead of ending in 24 is around 26, 27, for some, especially for some years. Although last year was a little bit lower than that. So we went from uh, harvesting by bricks using the old refractometer to harvest by very sensory. At least some people do it. Some people, especially winemakers, um, ask our, our, our growers to delay harvest, trying to promote a berry flavor development and also promote degradation of greens. And uh, well, some of the things that, get, that come along with berry sensory are true, some others are not that true, but uh, which, which seems to be true is that after 18, 19 weeks, there, there seem to be a um, significant trend on berry flavor development. Now, how do we measure that and how do we taste berries and all that? That's, as something that I'll try to address on my talk. Uh, some of the key factors, uh, and I just put some some of them here and uh, there, but I'm, I'm sure we can we can all think about m many more. Um, of course, in the middle, it's gotta be wine style. Depending on what kind of wine we want to make, that's gonna be what we want, and, what, and and that's gonna define the maturity point that we harvest our grapes at. Things like vine balance, yield losses, and then flavor development, understanding by the fruit flavors, and also green aromas. Those are all going to impact our harvest decision. Some other um, factors that I'm not going to talk today, but I'm sure uh, we all have them present, are 
cultivar, soil, rootstock, and we, we can keep going on um, <coughs> adding, adding some others to the leaves, like crop low, for example. The weather, um, what I want to show in this graph is how the weather changes um, between seasons. If we remember what I was saying before, 04 was a year when we had a lot of issues with hang time. A lot of a lot of people, a lot of winemakers were complaining our our grapes tasting very green, very late in the season, <clears throat> and we and we ended up uh, harvesting a very high bricks. Um, compared to that, in 07, I didn't hear many people complaining about greens, and I, and overall, I think the the sugar I harvest, the bricks I harvest, were fairly lower compared to 04. So what I have here, um, by the way, Fry Ranch is one of our ranches in uh, Hillsburg in Sonoma. Um, and you can see how weather can really uh, be different from season to season. <clears throat> now what we're working on now is trying to understand how these things uh, impact well, green aromas and also uh, positive fruit, fruit um, aromas. When we talk about aromas, um, there are things that we can taste in the field and there are things that we just can't. Basically, um, between the first ones, the things that we do taste in the field are these two, the green, the green aromas, metoxyparacin being responsible for bell pepper, and then the C6 compounds that are responsible for all the fresh green um, aromas like a <coughs> fresh grass. Um, and then we have um, a little bit of free volatile aromas and then the, the rest, the rest of the aromas present on, the, on our berries, we, the human palate just don't, doesn't taste them. Um, there, there has been some research trying to quantify how much do, how much we taste and how much we don't taste. And um, I think it's pretty clear now that the, the, the fraction that we actually taste, especially when we talk about these things compared to, the, to these other things, is, is fairly uh, small around 10, 20 percent of all the positive aromas present on the berries, that's what we taste. So that's, um, of course, that, that's an issue when we talk about berry sensory because we start with our berries and we taste only a, um, a small, a little fraction of whatever is present there. So what are we tasting, what are we really tasting on the field? And um, if we compare, these are our intensity units, um, measured by sensory, if we compare the green aromas against the fruity aromas, well, we basically, um, as a proportion, we taste way more of the greens compared to the fruity aromas. Here you have what, what is present on the grapes, and then the same green aromas measure on partially fermented mast. It goes from, in this case, from 2,000 to 12,000. And now look what happens with the fruit aromas we only had, well, these are free volatile aromas, so the ones that we taste in the field, they go from, from 1,000 to 200,000. So um, that's, gonna, that's gonna affect um, the things that we are able to measure in terms of berry sensory and the, 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 what, what we can do with that. And you can have an idea already that um, um, it's gonna be easier, easier to taste the green aromas than to taste and correlate them with wine sensory than to taste positive fruit aromas and try to correlate them with wine. Wine balance, um, I'm gonna go really quick about this, but uh, here we have an experiment that we had in a Cabernet <coughs> in Sonoma, sorry, um, with three different yield pruning ratios. And um, the extremes are, you know, some people say the extremes are never good and, and this seems to be the case. Um, here, here the graph shows the influence of, of um, the yield pruning ratio on benzyl alcohol, which is one of the compounds responsible for dark um, fruit aroma, dark chami aromas. And um, you can see how both the lower ratio and the highest ratio, they reach lower levels of, of that compound. And the one that is, you would say, most balanced, <clears throat> the one in green here, reaches um, reaches not only a higher values, but also uh, the values are higher earlier in the season, which is always good. And, and take a look also at the bricks, how this one that, um, 
that is uh, that has the lowest uh, ratio. The, the day here is the day that we <clears throat> um, that we that we have this point here. And by September 6, we have this level. In contrast, by September 20, on the vines that are balanced, we have this much level. And then on the other one, that is you will say overcropped. In October 3, we we barely had that that much of, of this compound. The yield losses, and I'm going to talk a little bit uh, more um, later during my during my presentation. But uh, this is something that has become more pop more usual now. Um, it's not very it's not very unusual to go at the the end of September, beginning of October, and see things like this. Although this is these are two um, bunches of cereal, but uh, you'll see them fairly, fairly common on uh, Cabernet and Merlot. And you can see all the dimplings and all the berry shrivel consequence of uh, delay, um, rep, delay harvest. So to talk about the correlation between sensory and chemistry, we initiated a project in 04. So we have four years of data. We like to call it the Gala Maturity Project. Um, but the overall goal, one of the goals is to <clears throat> develop a model that predicts optimum time of fruit harvest based on both berry sensory and fruit chemistry. And there's um, also three, three, um, three of our goals, but basically, just to make a long story short, what we do is we go to the field every, um, we go to the, f we have, fi um, sorry, 57 blocks, and then we have uh, both uh, white and red cultivars. For, uh, red, for red cultivars, we start harvesting <clears throat> our plots, our five-time five replicate plots, are on 18 bricks, and for the whites, we start around 12. Of course, we we, won't, we wouldn't make wine at those uh, low bricks, but we want to know how all our berry chemistry and even our berry sensory changes over time, and how how that's related to crop load and crop, um, um, and yield losses. So you can see some of the cultivars that we have there. Um, we have it in four different regions, Sonoma, Napa, Lora, and Madera. Uh, the weekly harvest that I just said, very sensory, the same, the same group of people, around four, between four and five people, the same people go to, go to the same vineyard or at about the same time of the day, every week, the same day of the week. And they do um, a very sensory scorecard. Then they take a sample and send it to a berry, um, to a chemistry lab. And also we make wines um, for reds after 20 bricks. And again, we wouldn't make commercial wines at 20 bricks, but that's just to uh, understand what's going on in terms of berry chemistry and how that's related to berry sensory. And then finally, well, this is the amount of wines that we made in four years. So that's, um, that's quite, a, quite a bit of um, sensory that we had to do in, on all those. They, they all get sent to the sensory lab for descriptive analysis. And I'm going to talk uh, just a little bit about the project because uh, we have so much data. It will, take, uh, it will take me a couple of days to cover it all. But um, one of the questions that we had is if we can characterize or measure berry sensory, we call them buckets analytically. And what we call buckets are these four here, veggie or vegetal nodes, green fruit, fresh fruit, and chamois fruit. And um, inside each one, we have these uh, descriptors, veggie, unripe, fresh, overripe, cook, dry, spice, and floral. And um, there's, a, there, there's a picture of um, all, all these, um, these people that go to the field on the same day, the same time of the day, well, they, they, they each one have a PDA with a scorecard that was developed, just thinking on all these buckets, as we call it. So they score on a weekly basis all these attributes on a scale from one, from, sorry, from zero to five, being high, being five the highest. And then finally, the, the, the biggest question is if we can link that, if we can link, link berry sensory to wine sensory profiles, because at the end of the day we make wine. Uh, um, so that's our fi final product, and that's what we, that's what we really care about. So we, um, with all of that info, we build graphs like this. Here you have um, for a cab in Sonoma, I believe this was 04. 
flavor intensity sensory, and then two things, fruit characteristics and green characteristics. And the red arrow here shows the date that the block was commercially harvested. Now, a couple of things here, and, uh, and this has become um, usual, at least for our vineyards. We, all, we pretty much every single year, we are harvesting at the point that we passed our peak in fruit characteristics, and um, that point coincided with the lowest in terms of greens. Um, so at least our makers, and I think um, that's a common common thinking on, among winemakers for different areas. They don't want any kind of green on the grapes, so they, they always seem to be asking growers to don't, har don't harvest, don't harvest, let the, let them, let the grapes hang longer because that's going to get rid of the greens, which sometimes is true. Um, but it'd be nice to find a balance between these two things so at least we can uh, harvest at the closest to, closer to the peak of fruit characteristics of fruit aromas. Um, well, I showed this one already, but um, always keep in mind that uh, we taste just a few, just a little fraction of aromas present on the on the on the grapes, and we taste more of the greens than what we do of the fruit of the fruity aromas. So when we talk about um, green aromas or vegetative aromas, well, um, the most well known is methoxyparacin, a responsible for bell pepper. Um, and that's the chemical structure, nobody has to remember it, don't worry about it. Um, these are some other compounds that we have identified. Um, well, the first one again is methoxyparacin, responsible for bell pepper. And then there come at least seven compounds that are all six carbon compounds, and responsible for mostly fresh, uh, fresh grass and hay, uh, and also green uh, aromas. Um, a little bit of um, data from the same project, uh, the same the same Cabernet Sauvignon. Do you know for? I have to say the numbers here are wrong. This should be ten times higher. So this instead of being three is thirty. <coughs> this instead of being one is ten. But, uh, um, we know already, and, and there, there's quite a bit of work on the bibliography, the literature that uh, says the methoxyparacin peaks around variation and then starts to decline. That's the same thing that we found. Um, the grapes are ripening and reaches a minimum, a minimum concentration near the end of the season. Now, when do we need? When do we reach that minimum? Changes, or or for different, it's different for the different years. Another factor that um, has has to do with that uh, degradation of methoxyparacin is shading or fruit exposure. We know that. Um, and the less fruit, the less uh, sunlight or fruit or the berries receive, the, the longer it takes for them to degradate all the methoxyparacin. That's what we have here. Methoxyparacin, again, the units here should be 50, and this is 10. Here's um, on, on blue uh, the curve corresponding to berries that were clusters that were exposed, fully exposed. And then in green, uh, clusters that were shaded. You can see how both. How the, how the degradation rate is, is, fairly, is completely different. By the way, um, for methoxyparacin, the threshold for detection for human palate is around 15 pp3s. So keep in mind, this is, this is 10, 20. So it will be here. For this case that we have shared, shaded cluster, sorry, we wouldn't even be picking at these bricks. And that's when we get in trouble with hang time, yield losses, and all that. Um, and also how this change, this, this is completely different year from year from year to year. We had the same block, it's, a, it's, a, it's another Cabernet, um, uh, a dry creek valley in Sonoma, and we have methoxyparacin degradation, methoxyparacin evolution, if you want to call it that way. For 04, 05, and 06, and look at 04, what I, what I was saying before, how do you know for we have so many, so many problems, degradation of, degradation of green, sorry. And we had to, had to hang our, our fruit longer later in the season to get rid of those green notes. So you can see how the urinal seeks, you pretty much started with low levels. And then at 22 bricks, basically we didn't have anything already. 
you know, O5, we started with very high levels, but the degradation rate was pretty fast. And in O4, we started with high levels, and then by the time that we reach 26, uh, 25, 26 rig, we still have quite a few methoxyparacin in our, in our uh, berries. Some of the factors that um, we know uh, affect that uh, are uh, temperature before vibration and after vibration. As I say, methoxyparacin peaks right before vibration. And um, at least for some data that we have, it seems that whatever factor promotes uh, growth, canopy growth, that's going to give you a higher methoxyparacin concentration in your berries. Um, well, we did the same for fresh fruit, and those are some of the compounds that we identified um, for this project. And again, looking at the data, the four-year data. Um, I'm not going to go over each one. The, that's just the, the purpose of the slide is to show you that um, different different compounds give you different different flavors on the, on your berries. The same for chamois fruit. And we did all this because we wanted to build a chemical, a so-called chemical aroma index. We wanted to be able to measure whatever compounds we have in the berries and estimate how the wine was going to taste like. So that's, our, that's an example for fresh fruit, and that's just the equation that we came out with, which for the fresh fruit accounts for all the compounds that we identify as being responsible for fresh fruit. A little bit of um, some, of, some of the examples of that, that index. Here we're comparing our sensory, very sensory data against our, our index. You can see how both correlate very nicely. So that's, that's a good, that, that was a win for us. Um, we know now that we can go out to the field, grab a sample, measure methoxyparacin, measure C6 compounds, and we'll be able to predict, uh, sorry, the amount of green in our fruit and, and therefore the amount of green in our, in our wines. Um, although going from, from uh, fruit to wine, it's a little bit more challenging, but uh, for greens, it seems to work fairly well. For green fruit, take, taking the compounds that we know account for green fruit, again, our sensory, this is the sensory that those, those guys did on a weekly basis, and it seems to correlate fairly well. There seems to be a little bit of um, a problem at the end, but for the most part, they both align fairly well, so that, that's a good thing again. Now the bad news, when you do the same for fresh fruit, the values are all over. So that's, that's something that we are still working on it. And, um, and there's really a, lo a lot of work to be done on, on trying to identify the compounds responsible for fresh fruit and trying to build some kind of an index that will tell you how your, how your wine, not only how your berries are going to taste, but also what the correlation with your wine is going to be. That's where we uh, went to measure things like glucose glycosides, which are um, aroma, pre oh, so pe some people call them aroma precursors. And the, the, the reason why is because they are bound to sugar, so you don't taste them. When you go to the field and pull up um, some berries in your mouth and you, you, you taste, you don't taste any of these. You only taste them. They only get released after fermentation. And the good news is that they, they correlate very well between grape and wine. And again, that's the evolution of uh, glucose glycosides or aroma precursors by Briggs for all, all, all these data is for Cabernet, by the way. And it's all in Sonoma. Um, now, the, the biggest question that we had was can we link berry sensory with wine sensory? And it seems to work fairly well, even if we don't taste those glucose glycosides on the berries every time we go to the field and we taste the chamois fruit and grapes, this is aroma intensity by bricks, while the, the, the correlation with the chamois fruit and wine is, is pretty high, it's, it's fairly um, good. The same with um, uh, green aromas or vegetative characteristics. Uh, when we taste them in grapes, well, they're, they're going to be in the wine. So. Um, so far, with chemistry, um, what we found uh, for 
everything that has to be with green green aromas, um, veggie characters. We um, we know that we can go again go to the field, take a sample, measure metoxyparacin and C sixes, and that's going to give us a good idea. Now with the with the positive fruit attributes, that's something that we are relying still more on sensory than on chemistry, um, and that that's our next challenge is at least trying to predict based on sensory or based on chemistry how your, how our wine is going to taste like. Um, so far, we have we haven't been um, very successful, but uh, the point here is again, there's there's it's way easier to predict how green your wine is going to be than to predict how fruity your wine is going to be. Um, so again, um, going back to the same kind of graphs that we we like to build using the very sensory data, and here it's um it's the same graph that I showed before for a yield pruning weight of 3.2. Um, we have seen that um, especially degradation of, or degradation of greens is no, not linked to sugar loading, not, not linked at all, basically. But um, what seems to happen um, is when you have a rapid sugar accumulation like we had in 04, um, your fruit characteristics are out of sync with your, with your greens. However, however, when you go to um, fairly more balance, at least for us, what we understand balance, um, EL pruning ratio, um, the, the fruit development, the, the flavor development is a little bit more in sync with the degradation of greens. That's something that we, um, we are looking more and more into it, trying to define bind balance, and there's a lot of people that have worked with that. But um, it seems to me, at least, that no matter what you do, if your vines are, are not, they don't have a very good balance, you're going to have problems either for lack of fruity flavors or for a lot of green aromas. Now, of course, that uh, it's easy to say. Let's, let's balance our vines, but how do we do that? Well, that, that's, that's a topic for another day, I guess. Um, so what about color and mouthfeel components? Um, some of the things that we've seen change over time related to extended maturation, anthocyanins, and then uh, total phenols. Um, they do seem to increase with uh, maturity, but then when you when you reach those high um, maturity levels, 26, 25, 26, they both they both seem to stabilize, and they don't change that much. Look here, all these values are pretty much fairly the same. Here they are this, they are fairly equal. Um, going more to uh, mouthfeel, the relation between monomers and polymers seems to uh, decrease over time. Although again. Um, I think in the past when we used to harvest our grapes at 24 bricks, these things used, they were more important for us. Now, um, what happens when you go beyond 26 bricks, this relation doesn't seem to change that much. So we, we do have to look for something else to explain the change in the mouthfeel. And that again is a topic for another day. Uh, something to always keep in mind. Um, it's very important to know how much color you have in your berries, what, what the anthocyanin content is, but never forget that you can have a lot of uh, anthocyanins, but you still have to extract them. And um, here what we have is berry color and wine color. Here are the berries, here's the wine. So even if the berries, the, the berry content doesn't change that much, there's almost a linear relation with the wine. And I'm gonna talk, um, a little bit more about this when I uh, when I cover irrigation, if I have time. Uh, I showed this graph already, but the purpose of that was to show you guys that sugar loading is not related to degradation of greens. Um, again, the same the same vineyard on three different years. Look how we reach low levels of metoxyparacin of very different bricks. Uh, a little bit more confusing, but uh, it's another another vineyard, you know, four and 05, with two different 
tons per acre. Of course, uh, the difference a little bit on sugar. Here's fruit sugar accumulation in terms of grams of sugar per grams of fruit per day. And here we have metoxyparacin. Look how for both years, the, the degradation of metoxyparacin is completely different. Even if these two lines are not much different, there, there's way more, the, the difference between degradation of rate for degradation of greens for the two years is way bigger. And also, the timing when we reach 24.5 bricks, 24 being the standard, all the standard in terms of maturity is completely different. In this case, you know, in uh, 04, we reach 24.5, around 9, 10, 10 weeks after operation. On, on this other year, we reach at 14 um, weeks after operation. So always keep, a, keep an eye on crop, on crop load and on uh, sugar loading. Keep in mind that sugar loading is not really correlated with either fruit, fruit uh, flavor development or degradation of greens. A little bit more the same, but looking at glucose glycoside or aroma precursors. The same, exactly the same vineyard during 07 and 06. Glucose glycoside by sugar per berry. Complete different values of sugar. Fairly similar levels of glucose glycoside. Um, at least in my opinion, in California, unless you go to a very cool area, you won't have much of a problem getting enough sugar in your berries. So, um, so, so far, very sensory and fruit ripening. It's an analytical tool that um, in some years uh, we can, uh, we can, we can um, estimate a berry, what we call a berry flavor profile. Vine balance and fruit ripening, always keep it in mind. Accumulation and extractability of color and mouthfeel components. You really, we should always be looking at not only how much we have, but how much of, the, of that is gonna go from the berries into our wine, and I show some data. Um, actually, I think in my last slide is about that. Um, and, the, and the last one is, well, we really don't understand much yet. So there's, a, there's a still a lot of work to be done. So the yield losses, um, a little work that we that we've done in the last four years. Here's a Cabernet Sauvignon. You know, six change in, in total yield as a percentage, right? By soluble solids. And you can see how the yield peaked around 22, well, 20, 21 bricks maybe, and then decreased. And that's the main reason why everybody complained, you know, for um, because of hang time and because we were hanging our grapes later than usual, waiting for those green notes to go away while we were going down on this, on this curve. Um, a little bit of numbers here. Com if you compare the reaction yield from 24 bricks, which is, again is the standard, the, the old standard, well, um, by 28 you lost, in this case, 13%. So it's around, I don't know, 3% 3, 3 by, by bricks point. Of course, that depends on cultivar. I'm talking about Cabernet, but we, we've seen uh, things like Sierra losing way more, more yield. Uh, and Merlot is fairly similar to Cabernet. Um, a little bit more the same vine yield as a percentage, but in this case, we had two different years, 06 and 07. And in both case, uh, starting at 100%, which was reached about 21 bricks, 20, 21 bricks. By the time that we harvest, we have lost 25%. Now, although if you if you do the same, but starting at 24, here's around 85, here's around, I don't know, 72, 73. So it's again, it's between two and 3% of yield lost um, per bricks point. The reason why we lost uh, yield, we lost water. The berries dehydrate, everybody's talking about berry shriveling now. Here's the same berry moisture by soluble solids. The, the same vineyard that I showed in the previous slide, do you know six, do you know seven? You can see how berry moisture declines fairly, fairly linearly over time. So, and lastly, I'm afraid I'm gonna go a little bit over, but I'm, I'll try to wrap up pretty, 
uh, pretty soon. Um, so extended maturation, yield losses due to berry dehydration. I showed that already. There's flavor development and there's degradation of greens. So our, uh, our question when we start the next experiment that I'm going to show was, well, how do we put all these things in a bag and take the best that we can out of it? So we did this experiment. It was uh, an irrigation management experiment, and I'm going to show um, not the three years of data because we'll be here for all day. <coughs> but um, it's a Cabernet Sauvignon close to Hillsborough, and it has two irrigation treatments with five replicates, weekly harvest after 22 weeks, berry chemistry, and also I forgot to put the berry sensory also after 22 weeks, berry chemistry after 22. So once the once the grapes reach 22, we will go to the field and take a sample, a replicate sample. Oh, I, was, I should say five replicates um, every week. Then we did research wines four times after 24, 24 because, again, it's the old standard. And then we did wine sensory. And we did both descriptive analysis and triangle test. We have only two, uh, two treatments, so we, we, that, that will let us um, do triangle test. The treatments, just to uh, make a, a, sh a very long story, short. If we have here the stages of development, bud break, bloom, very set, variation, 20 weeks, harvest. The first treatment, which we call RDI, regulated deficit irrigation, or which is the standard for most of our uh, vineyards. You start somewhere around here because of the rainfall, right? And then you go oh, pretty much all the way, 70, around 70% 70 ETC. Some, some people do 60, some people go even lower. We didn't want to go lower because we were afraid we were going to lose too much yield. So we kept it around 70%. The second treatment, what we call the ramp up. Up to this point, up to 20 bricks, it was exactly the same, no difference whatsoever. Once the, once the, the berries reach 20 bricks, we increase the irrigation from 70 to close to 100%. But keep in mind, there was no difference for all this period of time. The, the only difference between the two treatments was after 20 weeks. And then we kept it all the way until harvest. So just to give you an idea, for, for this case, from 20 weeks to harvest, there were between 40 days, 30 and 40 days which is almost nothing compared to all this, all this, period, all this time. Um, the first thing that we were, we were concerned about were the yield losses. So that was the first thing that we look at. Here you have, this day here is about 10 days after we ramp up. <clears throat> so both treatments were the same, right? And then look at the evolution of yield, of berry weight over time for the ramp up and for the RDI. So they both separate very nicely over time. Although one thing that I want to point out here, it doesn't mean that we don't lose yield with the ramp up, we just lose less. Um, the, ex the explanation for that, fruit moisture. Again, fruit moisture is the key. Fruit moisture in terms of grams of water per berry over time, both, both treatments separated very, very nicely. The ramp up here, the RDI here. One thing that was uh, a little bit surprising was to find a difference, well, we found a difference on fruit, um, fruit load, uh, sorry, sugar loading. Um, here, if we, if we look at this graph, we have fruit sugar content, gram, grams of sugar per berry over time, and we have the two treatments, ramp up, reaching higher values, higher levels of sugar in terms of gram or sugar per berry. Interestingly enough, I don't, I'm not going to show the graph, but if you plot bricks, these two th these, the difference that we got here makes the bricks be fairly similar. Um, something that we weren't concern, concerned, sorry, and a lot of people are, um, now I think is more aware of, the benefits of keeping your vines, keeping your cannabis active later in the season. What we did here was to, to go to the field around two week, around one time, once every two weeks, sorry, and measure leaf chlorophyll content. 
look at both, how both treatments separate ramp up remaining greener over time compared to the RDI where the canopies were, if you want to say, collapsing. Or the, if we, we measure leaf area at this point, we measure leaf area here, total leaf area per vine, there was no difference. And the reason why the ramp up was started at 20 bricks, by that point, the canopies had already stopped growing. Then what we did, we went and measured leaf area here. And these three men had a, had a higher percentage of leaves that had fallen already. Whether well, this one, most of the leaves were still in the vine and most of the leaves were greener compared to the, compared to the um, RDI. Uh, also, things that we measure, we measure leaf water potential, photosynthesis, uh, significant differences among treatment, between treatments. The vines didn't regrow, as I say. We ramp up at 20 bricks. If you ramp up earlier, well, you might find difference. On, you know, you might find that your vines could regrow. Um, actually, the main reason why we ramp up at 20 bricks is because we don't want we don't want our vines to regrow. And we've seen, we tried um, a couple of years ago uh, a side experiment, very very little, when we ramp up around 16 bricks, I think it was, and the vines start regrowing. Um, now, surprisingly, uh, and again, my apologies, but I don't have enough time to show all the data, the berry chemistry wasn't that different. Same levels of methoxyparacin and C6. Keep in mind, the key here is that you, you ramp up at 20 bricks. By 20 bricks, your greens should be low, and they were in this year that we, well, this was also in 07, which for most of the season, the greens were low. Um, groups of glycosides or aroma precursors, there was no difference. Uh, um, if there was any difference at all, um, the ramp up show higher levels of glucose glycosides. Uh, uh, my only explanation is, again, keep your vines healthy, keep your vines working later in the season. Now, of course, you don't want to go overboard and overwater your vines. Color mouthfeel, I show my last two slides there. Huh? Um, wine composition, I'll go, I'll go really quick over this. These are the four wines, four set of wines that we made, or you know, over time, having both control and ramp up, control and ramp up. Things like alcohol, TA, malic acid, pH, total phenols, and anthocyanins. If you look, since I don't have much time, I'm going to focus on the total phenols and anthocyanins. If you look at the first date, the control shows higher levels of both, more color or more phenols. <clears throat> so there see, it seems to be the, um, right after you ramp up, there is a dilution. I'm not saying that there's not. Now, um, over time, that dilution disappears. And not, and not, not only that, but if you look at the first set of wines, uh, the last third set of wines, sorry, the values are reversed. Total phenos, and we've done this for three years in a row and found exactly the same. Now, how is that possible? If we look at the grape data, we didn't find we didn't find a difference between this is anthocyanins. I'm sorry, it's so slow, so so small, but I I, I wasn't going to be able to feed everything. So here's the grape da grape data. There's not much of a difference between the two treatments over time. Now here's what happens when you look at the wine data. <clears throat> For the fourth dates again, that we made wines that. Let's look first at these two points. And as I say, it seems to be an initial dilution. <clears throat> Even if there's no difference here, the ramp up shows the wine um, um, lower levels of both. Here, here we have total phenols, and here we have anthocyanins. These are phenols, these are anthocyanins. So for both of them at the beginning, you do have a dilution. Look what happened at the end. They both reversed. And again, I, I apologize again. I don't have time for to show all the data. If you were going, if you were going to look at the extractability data, you'll see how that changed over time. And um, and at the last uh, at the last two dates that we made wines, the extractability was far superior on the ramp up compared to um, the control, which means we extract more of what we have in percentage. 
Just as a brief summary, if done at, right, at the right time, we have the smaller yield losses, we have greater sugar loading, which offsets the dilution, and we end with fairly similar levels of bricks. There's a positive effect on buying health. We haven't seen negative effects, or at least large negative effects on fruit and wine composition. And always keep in mind that, that I think that's the challenge for all of us that do research, is to understand how cultural practices, especially irrigation, crop law, affect that. And here's an example of something that a grower should never do. Um, another side experiment, it's a, it's a Cabernet Lore this time. When we had our standard treatment, this was kept all the way, all, you know, pretty much most of the season under 80% ETC. It's my last one. <laughs> and, um, and then we ramp up at 20 bricks. Well, the grower didn't believe us, and he went on ramp up aberration. And he was free to science. And you see the difference when you ramp up at 20 bricks and when you ramp up aberration. So that's uh, good learning, I guess. Thanks to all the, the winery, the company, research winery, especially the Grape Assessment Lab, Grape and Wine Sensory Lab, Shibiai Growers, and uh, the Nick Dukuslian's Lab. Most of you know some of those guys. Yeah. What was the BRICS level at your final uh, wine lot? For this, uh, for 07, it was around 26.8, almost 27. Yes. Oh, well, the question was the preference on the wine. Um, actually, I had a wine tasting today uh, in the morning. And again, for the first set of wines, for those wines that are made early, around 24, 25 bricks, pretty much everybody seems to prefer the control. For the late ones, for the ones that are between 25, 26, 27 bricks, I had 50 people tasting wines today. They, all of them preferred the ramp up. They thought it was I had a better mouthfeel, and it was also it had better fruit. That was a percent of an increase in the ramp up, and um, before the ramp up, the, the vineyard was both treatments were under 70 percent ET, and then we went to 100 percent ET, so a 30 percent increase. Although you have to remember that at that, that time of the year, ET is going down, so it's not really 30 percent; it's less than that. That was that, that was the last that was the last wine made four or seven when we did it in, in 05 and six. No, that, that's, that's, that's for your experiment, right? Yes. Okay, that's considerably higher than the Samoa average for uh, governing Soviet. Yes, it is. Um, again, the goal of the experiment was to track berry sensory, berry chemistry, and yield losses over time. And uh, for that particular vineyard, the vineyard was harvested at, the, at 20, almost 26 bricks. 